Now we've got a panel of um, fantastic characters here and um, I would absolutely encourage them when they answer questions to back things up with any stories from their past um, which can illustrate some of the, the points that we, that we, we talk about. So um, firstly, I ask them all to introduce themselves just in two or three minutes and let us know a little bit about their history um, of their businesses, how they got into shipping and why they're here with us today. If I can start with, with George on my left, please. <clears throat> Thank you. Uh, I'm a third generation ship owner uh, from one side of the family and fifth generation uh, from the other side of the family. Uh, it was natural to follow the footsteps of the others and I'm the last remaining one of the clan. That's about all. Is that enough or do you want more? Anything else you would you would like to to add, or, or should we come in later? Or let's or let's do it later. Okay, okay. Basil, how did you get into shipping? It's coincidence a long story. Or something more it's a long about? story. Uh, pure coincidence. My uh, college degree is in chemistry biology, and I was in Houston. And my first job was. Uh, uh, a shipping agent in Houston boarding tankers and that was um, the end of the story. I'm hooked in shipping and uh, it's been almost 18 years now. 18 happy years? Uh, absolutely. And, and George <laughs> Tavarilis. Tav 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 You've got a smile on your face for some reason but I'll make it simple at this stage. Um, now, I started from, my father actually established a business in the, uh, just after the Second World War, 19, in, the, um, in the 40s. Um, we were brought up in the business. Uh, shipping was more a way, a way of life rather than a profession. Um, I think basically, to be honest with you, I probably uh, began to love shipping because I'm probably, I mean, this is probably my romantic side of my story. I'm very passionate about life. I'm, I'm overwhelmed by childish enthusiasm. I love the sea, and I love the challenge. And basically, in this business, ladies and gentlemen, I can assure you, you will never die from boredom. Thank you. <laughs> Nicholas. I have to speak louder because I want to wake everybody. <laughs> I have difficulties in following your question. Can you please repeat? I just really wanted you, Nicholas, to share with the audience a little bit about your history, how you ended up <laughs> okay. in, the, in the shipping industry. Before starting uh, with my story, I would like to ask those who do not understand Greek to raise your hands. There are only four or five. So you will allow me to speak in Greek as we have translation services. Is this correct? Mm -hmm. Is this just, correct? Let me just grab my translation exactly. service. So we are going to amortize the cost which was spent by the sponsors for the translation <laughs> until you put the four, you put your uh, iPhone on. I want to say I'm a fourth generation ship owner from the island of Sifnos. My grand-grandfather left the island of Sifnos in the mid-19th century and went to Constantinople. He first, uh, his first work was with a rowing boat to transport goods and things from one side of the Bosporus to the other. My grandfather probably developed these rowing boats to sailing boats and steamboats. And because of a family member uh, who was a diver, he decided to offer uh, salvage services to the vessels transiting uh, the Dardanelles and the Bosporus. So the name of Ernikos uh, 
came familiar with thugs and salvage. My grandfather, uh, with the same name with me, had eight children. The nine were born in Constantinople, and my father, the eight, on the island of Sifnos. He had the luxury of using the tugboats to visit the island regularly. So the house which I still use and my grandchild uh, stay is the sixth generation in the same house. Uh, he decided to move from Constantinople to Piraeus after the First uh, World War, before the, what we say, Mikrasiatiki catastrophe in Greece. And since uh, the early 20s, we are based in Greece. We are based in Greece in Piraeus, and we have diversified in many forms of shipping, including ocean going and professional tourism. And we also, and always, feel proud to be from the island of Sifnos with origins from Constantinople. Thank you very much. You are Thank welcome. Much. And um, Emmanuel Vordonis. I was, because I was not a third, fourth, fifth generation ship owner, I was the son of an engineer and a family of lawyers and doctors and things like that, but I had a dream for the ships. And I was, I grew up just at the water of an island. I come, I come from Kimolos and I come from Syros and I come from Spetses, three islands cooperating. And because I had the dream of a boat and the dream of the ships, at a certain stage of my life, I felt I was, doing, I was studying physics and philosophy. I said that the only way to get closer to ships is that I study something related to ships. And then this beautiful smiling girl, daughter of a fifth generation ship owner, gets very much in love with me. And the father is very happy to adopt me as his son-in-law. This did not happen, and my wife was a dentist, but uh, I was lucky enough that the Martinos people, uh, who were starting a, fa a family business in the 70s, adopted me, and I joined the company in 1970. I stayed with them for 42 years, and so I grew up in shipping, which is an industry I love, I love the ships, the ship, the seafarers, and the water. So that's how I'm here. And I think all of us on this panel are of an age where we're thinking about a generational transition to hand over to the next generation. And I think it's something that it's really affecting all of the ship-owning families in, in Greece. Um, and I, I'd like to ask um, Emmanuel how you've tackled this thorny issue. I mean, firstly, it's a, it, it, it's a difficult subject to, to raise. Who's going to control the family? Who's going to control the ships? And then there's the question of the, the different men mentality of the generations. I mean, I'm sure with... Um, with your generation of, of ship um, operators and owners, if you need to um, think about a, a river, and we were talking about this earlier, you're sending somebody up the Orinoco in, in um, Latin America, or um, up the Pearl River in China, and I know the Dnipro River in, in Ukraine with all its rapids and all its hazards in, at every twist and turn, and you need some very skilled pilots there. I mean, how do you, do you choose that pilot in a different way to the, to the next generation? The question is to me. To you, absolutely. Yuri talked about the idiosyncrasies of what we are doing and the complexity of running a ship which is exposed to a multiple of changing situations. I mean, strikes, weathers, uh, shallow waters, uh, economic conditions. So you need people, particularly if you are a member of the Greek community, which is world traders and world travelers, 
you need a skill which develops through the years to respond to situations with fast reflexes. So that is how our, our older ship owners started. I think that ship owners, shipping industry in Greece was driven by the scarcity of resources in this country and mainly the poverty and mainly the smallness that made the Greeks since the 6,000 years ago, Jason, to want to get out of the country and explore the seas and reach the other countries. So it was a desire and a need to expand out of a small country and create our living and uh, balance our curiosity of the world. So all these tendencies and skills of this uh, DNA of the people here created the shipping community. And Yuri asked how you go from one generation to the other. It's a very interesting thing. Myself, in my working days, I followed the CM Limos and the Trandris to his sons, uh, the Trandris generation and the Captain Sakos to Nicolas, my generation of Martinos to the, to the children. I've observed three generation changes. And different families and different companies responded in different ways. And it was a critical moment in the life of companies to make this transfer. Not in shipping only. I mean, you had this problem with the Gucci's and Ferragamos in Italy and all the Pernod Ricard. It's not easy to make a transition within a family organization to different generations. And also to make up your mind if your children and successors really want to take over or have the talent to take over or have a in different interest. So I don't think there are recipes. It's interesting that in the Greek community, it seems that transition is happening in a smooth manner and successful manner. And that is now that we have a new generation at the leadership of shipping companies. Greek shipping is still very strong and growing. Uh, it's interesting to study it and it's interesting to learn from this, I would call it success story. In terms of the, the practical considerations, the, the, the difference in mentality between the generations for the operational issues, that what, what I was trying to, I, I mean, I appreciate the, 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 the the, the problems of transition in the in, in the family, the centers of power in the family, but what about the actual the way that problems are um, the way that practical problems operational problems are approached? Do you feel there 's an over reliance on data sometimes amongst the the younger generation and there 's more of a love of the sea and more, um, you're, you're communing more with the natural elements in, in, in your generation. This to me again? Absolutely. <laughs> you know, in the older times, the people who had the responsibility to take decision in shipping, we grew up organically and biomatically. So we developed some kind of patterns of thinking and the capacity to respond fast and intuitively to resolve problems which were acute. In the younger generation shipping, where the boys taking over are coming from excellent school with excellent education, but not this organic, biomatic experience, it seems that there is a tendency to go to technology to employ consultants, to adopt key performance indicators, best practices, uh, dashboards, qualitative data assessments, big data assessments, which is all very, very good. I think it's very important that in this complex environment, we take the advantages of technology, 
which gives us information which we can assimilate and then analyze. But having said that, this analysis of data and this effort for automatic non-human brain decision making, I think creates a tremendous risk of paralyzing and neutralizing the personal capability of the young leaders of the industry to take fast decisions and assume responsibilities. And this is a very interesting uh, separation line of how we can use technology to help us take decision, but avoid to allow technology dominate on human brain and human heart and feeling and intuition in taking decisions in this com complex environment. And in this complex environment and high-risk environment, I believe as an older man that we need this human experiential intuition and responsibility taking. Thank you. Basil, you wanted to come in. I think everybody wants to actually come in on this point. But, but, um, Basil, can I bring you in? Yes, uh, thank you, Yuri. Uh, but um, thank you for Mr. Bordonis' uh, comments. But um, if uh, to interject, uh, probably the concerns of this panel may be like, no, uh, the changes or the challenges they see in uh, the industry. Absolutely. I mean, and these, them, are the, these, are the major, these are major challenges. We mm -hmm. will discuss these as well as okay. other challenges. And, um, and, and I'm going to come on to market opportunities. But I wanted to, to, uh, um, to ask um, Mr. Tsavliris, um, um, is there still room for the hunch? in terms of market opportunities. Do we just look at the, the data or do we say, I've just got a gut feeling that this is going to succeed and you know, how many market opportunities do you exploit where you've, where you've seen the spreadsheets and you think, but I've got a feeling some of those aren't going to work and this is what I think is going to work. You've asked me quite a difficult question. You've put me in trouble, which I usually am anyway. Um, since I started the business, I, I've been in the business for, I think, close to half a century now. Um, I'd share some of uh, Mr. Bordoni's comments about children. I happen to have five children, and I've got one on the way, which is being born tomorrow, please God. So basically, my, my attitude in general towards shipping is um, I try to be more of a lateral thinker. I'm, I don't get on very well with logic. We've got logic around us, uh, we've got the science, we've got the, the expert advice, but I've been brought up in an environment where the people who've been closer to me, which is basically my father, who is the brainchild, and then subsequently a lot of the older generation ship owners, because I happened to lose my father when I was fairly young. I actually started my career when I was 25 years old, when my father passed away. So most of the people who I'd associate with at the time were people about 20, 25 years older than me. When you get the likes of Angelikosis, for example, you know, and, and, and Doni Angelikosis, who started as a Marconis, as a radio operator on a ship, was a close friend of the family, and I'd more frequently be in, you know, be in touch with him rather than his son. What I learned from the older generation, and they've got a lot of scar tissue, a lot of experience, and of course the fact they're still around still now, there must have been something right. And they all invariably, and they'll, if you have a, a quiet word with them, they'll, they'll tell you quietly that we listen to expert advice. They listen to the, or look at the graphs, they look at the uh, projections and the, all the official data which we get, whether through internet or through expert people around us. But at the end, ladies and gentlemen, I think to be quite honest with you, I think they mostly go by their gut feeling. They get the hunch, they get the feeling about something. They just invariably, including myself, quite frankly, you know, I don't think I've ever taken a commercial decision based on logic. And George, what, what does your gut feeling tell you that the opportunities are going to be, are going to be now? Well, look, the opportunities in the near future, which, in which market? Dry cargo, for example? Absolutely. Okay. Well, dry cargo, it's a billion dollar question, but nevertheless, uh, we have the situation with this, all these halabaloo going on with the scrubbers and all the technical requirements of the market, which will either 
probably cause the market to retract and have a lot of ships go for scrap because they won't be able to afford to go and put the one and a half and two million dollar scrubbers on ships which are 10, 12 years old. So therefore, the technical, in fact, I consider it inconsistent and I consider it totally illogical, by the way, just for the record. I think it's nonsense. But anyway, that's how the market has worked and that's what the regulators want to do, over-regulate rather than under-regulate. And uh, through those regulatory, re regulatory requirements, we're going to find a market which, unless the ship owners start going to a tantrum and start ordering ships, which is probably very likely as well, but if they don't, then I think of the next few years we may see a glimpse of positive light and perhaps a bit of uh, earnings, you know, more than what uh, one is earning today, which is literally break-even rates, the, 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 the best of circumstances. So I am positive and optimistic of the future, only, but it's, again, this is for the wrong reasons, because of the over-regulation. But I am still worried about the paranoic commercial drunkenness of some ship owners who may jump off the cliffs and start ordering ships and then back to square one. We'll, we'll break and make again, and we're back to you know, doomsday, if that happens. And um, Basil, is this something that you worry about, this paranoic commercial drunkenness, people um, too keen to jump into opportunities, or, or, or do you feel, look, there are some select opportunities now for investment which can be sensibly exploited? Um, I think that right now the market is overall balanced, but uh, unfortunately, I don't think it will take much uh, to have uh, a, a, a new spark of paranoia with new buildings. Um, the only good thing for right now is uh, capital is very tight and people have to think twice, but otherwise uh, um, it could be very easily uh, get into more trouble. Um, but so that's why sometimes I wish that uh, you know a, a steady, slow market may be uh, the best benefit for the overall industry. And Basil, where do you see the key investment and market opportunities? Um, that's a tough question. Probably, I would say, um, opportunistically, you have to evaluate opportunities. So one by one. I don't think there is uh, a general uh, rule of thumb. Just be careful, uh, good vessels, good um, proven business practices, I think, always will prevail. If I can bring in George Gratzos, um, a large percentage of the LNG gas-carrying ships being constructed are Greek. This appears a relatively new development for, for Greek shipping. A similar story happened with containers. Do you, do you feel that shipping here can always adjust and react to these new opportunities, no matter how big the challenge is, and, and, and where do you see, see them today? Shipping has always reacted to opportunities, but what I wanted to say is a few different things. I mean, uh, basically, when Greeks started uh, in shipping, that was about 10,000 years ago or something like that. Uh, but let's say uh, after the, uh, in the 19th century, uh, basically we were traders who had ships to use for the trade. So the essence was we were traders and we used the ships for us. And there were people like Vallanos, uh, 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 the Rally brothers, uh, my ancestors, the Theophilatos, people that had gone to, uh, what you call it, to um, uh, the Black Sea area, basically, which used to make, uh, used to produce, and does produce, a hell of a lot of wheat. And it was usually transported to North Europe, and from North Europe, uh, the things, uh, cargoes came down. At that time, even the captain uh, was a businessman, because the captain was the person that arranged the freights, he talked with the agents, he collected the money, he did all these kinds of things. So basically, in the 19th century, it was basically trading, and the ship was a means to trade. Uh, well, with telegraphs and all these things, etc., etc., for some reason or other, uh, the Greek shipping community elected uh, to become uh, ship managers. And I think uh, this is... Uh, a decision that uh, may not 
uh, have been the ideal thing because basically you want to be close to the cargo, close to the trade. Uh, if you, uh, for example, if you listen to Peter Drucker, he said because the purpose of business is to create a customer, the business enterprise has two and only two functions, marketing and innovation. Now, I'd like to know what the marketing and innovation it, in shipping is that makes us create the customer. Basically, no, 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 uh, uh, look, it's a business. It's not love of the sea and all that kind of stuff. It's a business. We're here to make money. Uh, and it's also interesting because I didn't, I decided not to say this thing in the very beginning. <coughs> but uh, from when, let's say in the 60s when I went to MIT, I studied naval architecture, but basically my big question inside me was how come we Greeks have a lot of ships, but we don't have cargoes, and we don't have all that much money. And uh, the only reasonable kind of uh, uh, answer I could find was that uh, maybe we're doing a business that nobody else wants to do, or to, to do it in a more financial way, uh, where the risk-reward ratio was insufficient, and you probably had to find uh, a way to beat the system if you could. Uh, so, uh, that is when I decided that I wanted to study the cycles and how the cycles were created and basically they're created by demand. So basically you cannot really know what you want to do if you don't understand uh, it's a demand-driven business. So what does your analysis tell you? Where are we at the moment? Depending on, on the sector, basically, you have uh, something, uh, uh, ec an economy that's more or less going better, a world economy that's going better. It's also transforming itself. Uh, company, uh, uh, what you call it, uh, 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 economies are maturing. And as economies mature, the mix of imports and exports changes. And therefore, it's a function of all these things. You can't take easy little answers. Uh, so uh, you have to go and try to understand how this will affect the sectors where you think that you have some expertise and some competitive advantage, really. Now, uh, I am basically uh, a bulk carrier operator and uh, I know the bulk market uh, and I can understand the way it works and I uh, uh, can see how demand goes etc and it's it's nothing as simple as you see world GDP going at three and a half percent and therefore every year you're going to have demand for bulk of so much it doesn't work that way uh, the, if you try to match the demand line, the, the, the world GDP with bulk, uh, 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 bulk demand, it's a very erratic, uh, it's a comparison that uh, uh, is plus or minus 4%. 4% is a tremendous difference to make in a year. Uh, it, it can alter all kinds of things. So basically you have to understand in quite some depth what you're actually doing in that or what's actually happening in that particular sector that you're interested in. If I you're not a jack of all trades. Absolutely. If I, if I can bring in Nicholas, um, which um, opportunities are you preparing yourself for at the moment? The opportunities from the side of my side are now a new generation. Παρόλο που ζω με έξι γυναίκες και η συμφωνία... <laughs> ευχαριστώ, ευχαριστώ. Μία γυναίκα, τρεις κόρες και δύο εγγονές. Η συμφωνία μου, πρωτού παντρευτώ με την σύζυγό μου, ήταν ότι μία από τις συμφωνίες που είχαμε κάνει είναι ότι δεν πρόκειται να πιέσουμε τα παιδιά μας να ακολουθήσουν τη δουλειά μας. Θα τα υποστηρίξουμε για να κάνει το κάθε πεδίο του κάνει κέφι. Σήμερα λοιπόν 
Το μεγάλο κέφι που κάνουν οι κόρε μου είναι να διαλέξουν γαμπρού που του αγαπάμε, που του θεωρούμε σαν παιδιά μα και μαζί αποφασίζουν τα ρίσκα που θα πάρουν. Και εγώ από πίσω και η γυναίκα μου τους υποστηρίζουμε. Και έτσι σπάσαμε την παράδοση που υπήρχε σε πολλές οικογένειες τη δικιά μας. Είπαμε ο παππούς μου είχε κάνει οκτώ παιδιά, τέσσερα αγόρια, τέσσερα κορίτσια και η παράδοση ήταν η δουλειά να μείνει στα τέσσερα αγόρια και τα ακίνητα στα κορίτσια. Κάτι το οποίο γινόταν και συνδρότανε πολύ στις προηγούμενες γενιές. Σήμερα λοιπόν η νέα γενιά που είναι ενωμένη και το θεωρώ αυτό τη μεγαλύτερη μου επιτυχία αποφασίζει για τα ρίσκα που θέλει να πάρει. I would like to um, throw it open to the audience if there's um, one or two um, questions that, that they may have um, to put to our panelists. Any, any questions from the audience? Um, in, in that case, we've, we've got a few minutes left. I, I'd just like to go to each panelist, um, starting with um, Emmanuel at, at the end, and if you could just say, what is the one key opportunity that you will um, invest in or focus on, and the one key challenge, the thing that you fear most, which can happen to the shipping market and, and your business? What is the opportunity? Uh, I think it's good to go back to what is the situation. Personally, I feel that the, the crisis we are experiencing is not another cyclic moment in the ups and downs of the shipping community. It is a very unique situation. In shipping, we are experiencing what the world is experiencing after the post-Lehman collapse, where the pre-Lehman euphoria created too many buildings, too many offices, too many steel mills, too many sugar processors, and there is an inflation, an oversupply in all sectors of the economy, which is, has shaking, shaken both economies and societies. Uh, quite a few years after the Lehman collapse, I think that the economies and societies are coming back to rebalancing. I think that Mr. Stopford presented some very useful information that the oversupply is still 15 million tons across the board and growth of economy and reduction in ship production may predict that the balance of the oversupply may be settled in the next three or four years, which means we are still in a crisis. Being in a crisis, my feeling, it's a personal feeling, right? And everybody, everybody around us being equally overstressed, the charter, the bank, with super high under collateralization, the shipyard with no orders and many thousands of workers, China with too many steel mills, so everybody has got his own problem, I think that in times of problems, it's better to try to create the synergies and invite the stakeholders to participate in sharing the risks altogether and increasing resistance. I will tell you a story. We had a charter with China and the Chinese could not perform. So somebody came at home, he did not want to come in the office, he said, Mr. Manole, Mr. Manole, you know what? In China, when it is very, 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 very cold, all the family goes in a small room, we breathe next to each other, we hold each other until the winter is over. So, 
help us until the winter is over. And I think that is a solution. A safe, free economy, sharing of the risks, sharing of the, pro pro of the uh, profits, synergic solutions. That's the opportunity for our future. And it's interesting that the Chinese are increasing their leasing finance, which, what does it mean? You don't go and buy a ship in distress at rock bottom price, which makes the seller hate you. You don't want to profit on him by killing him, but you make a long-term lease without talking about the asset depreciation. So leasing, which removes the price of a ship out of the equation, is a solution for financing shipping, I think, in the future, by not increasing too much the risk of, any, of, any, of anybody. So I think crisis is creating opportunities. Opportunity can be resolved, in my opinion, through synergic, cooperative sharing of both risks and profits. Thank you. And Nicholas, one key opportunity and one key challenge. Me? No, N N Nicholas. Nico, Nico, for you. One key opportunity and one key challenge which preoccupies you. There are many opportunities in life and there are many risks you can take. And someone who does not someone who do not take risks is dead. You have to take risks. So let's say in my business, which is similar to George Savlidi's business, a risk is to buy a salt ship who has been considered a CTL, a constructive total loss. And you say, okay, it is construct, it's a constructive total loss for the underwriters and maybe for the surveyors, but I can do something and repair it. So this is a risk which uh, I found in my business life several times, and most of the times it was profitable. Mm -hmm. The opposite is, of course, not catastrophe, but anyway, it's a risk you have to take in order to make profit. George Tsavlis, can you share your preoccupations and your dreams with us? Because you're short of time, I'll try to make it a little bit simple. Uh, from a practical point of view, buy the rumor and sell the fact. Take it one step further. In today's market, if we are talking about something more practical, that's which I think the, the question is, the way it's addressed, is stick to, um, if you're going to dry cargo, I think we are veered to dry cargo, from what I gather so far, at least with my colleagues here. Stick to older ships, quality ships building, quality yards. Don't go for the flamboyant new buildings. And because basically, anybody will tell you that in shipping, most money is usually made by older ships, where you have the flip of the market, you've got more of a volatile market, and that's why you can probably make an easy turn on resale. And you're doing it with less capital, so you've got less risk. On a more philosophical approach, even though being Greek, I shouldn't be quoting American philosophers, but the guy by the names of Edwin Land, who's the person who, who invented the Polaroid camera, said the following. Never undertake a project in life unless it is manifestly important and virtually impossible. <laughs> so, ladies and gentlemen, go for it. And Basil, we've had discussions today about greenhouse emissions, about regulations, about technology. Are these the key challenges for you, or are there others you'd like to draw our attention to? Um, probably, yes. Uh, probably technology is a big issue, but I will think that uh, 
let's uh, stick with the basics, uh, access to capital and access to cargo. I think that it's uh, the most uh, critical and uh, more, most safe uh, way going forward. And what is the key challenge for you, George? interesting things happening all over the place. Uh, the, the key challenge is trying to persuade uh, people uh, on what is uh, the best thing to do. Uh, for example, uh, you must understand that uh, as, well, uh, as um, uh, Mr. Vardoni said, Manolis, uh, they had wonderful ship chartered to a charterer, uh, probably a big charterer in China, wasn't paid because the, China, uh, the, the charter went bust. So there's no security in any kind of charters, etc. Your security is buying an asset, a good asset at a good price in order to have a cost benefit, a, a, a ship that can work cost benefitly. Because if you buy a ship, let's say, at $10 million, uh, and uh, uh, you're, let's say, not making, uh, you're breaking even or even less than break even. You know that the market is self-correcting. Ships will go for scrap if they don't make enough money, and the non-competitive ships go for scrap. Therefore, sooner or later, it's going to go for scrap, and the market will balance. So how soon is sooner or later? When the market goes below a certain value, it takes about two months for scrapping to start en masse. So more or less, you will be able to have uh, scrapping balance the market in a little time. Now, furthermore, you must understand one other thing. Ship like, a ship like a car moves. So it can move at different speeds. If it is going faster, it will show up in the market sooner, and therefore the market will, will seem to think that there are more ships. But if it's going slower, it's going to, uh, there's going to be a scarcity of ships. Because of the way the uh, economics of ship design are, and your bunker prices, uh, and your uh, bunker consumption goes up with a cube of the speed, you have fixed costs and variable costs. So anyone, everyone is going to travel his ship where he, he maximizes the profit for the charter uh, rate that he has, whether it's the charter or the owner. Therefore, there is flexibility in the supply and demand. So it's not, you don't match this number with that, that number. There are all these flexibilities that you must take into account. Uh, that being the case, what you want is to be able to buy a ship cheaply because if you buy the same ship at, at, uh, at the same age ship, two years later at $14 million, uh, you, you have, uh, uh, that would be, uh, yes, you have probably increased your break-even cost by about 15 to 20%. So basically, you are not going to be a cost-efficient transport provider. Whereas if you have bought, had bought the ship at 10 and lived through a bad time for a year, maybe that would have cost you a million dollars and you would have the ship with $11 million and not 14 and therefore you would have a much more cost competitive ship. So it's a matter of arithmetic, trying to understand what on earth you're trying to do and figure out what your customer wants because as Drucker said, you have to create a customer. So you create a customer if you're more cost efficient transporting uh, whatever he wants to transport. That's uh, what I wanted to say. Well, I'd very much like to thank all our panelists for sharing their key challenges and the opportunities they see in the in the shipping market with us i mean my key challenge is actually digitization and um, particularly at home and my wife said to me the other day um, um, please can we just communicate on twitter on social media and I said to her, why is that? And she said, well, I'm sick of hearing all your anecdotes and it'd be best if you just restricted yourself to 140 characters. So that's, um, that's one challenge that I'm trying to meet, although I, I still like the human 
element, and I think this is something we've discussed today, maintaining that, that um, marriage between the, the, pers the person and the, the machine, which is a great challenge for the, for the industry. And I, I'd, I'd like to thank all our speakers and panelists. George, just you'd very quickly like to, yes, to come in. Something because um, uh, uh, Manoli said something quite important before, uh, that it was, uh, it's a crisis that we never saw before. Uh, yes, in our lifetimes, no, but you had the exact same crisis in 1929 and that caused the shipping crisis in 1932 because the shipping crisis happens after because it takes time for it to feed through the various economies. Now, I will tell you a little story uh, how Mr. Onassis got into, his, yes, uh, into the business mm -hmm. Uh, because Mr. Onassis was my Uncle Constantine's bosom buddy from childhood. Uh, now, uh, he was doing cigarettes and all that kind of stuff in Argentina, and he wanted to make a, build where, um, a warehouse to have some uh, more tobacco being sent to him, etc., etc. And that was about 1932. And my uncle uh, was visiting Argentina and talking to him, and he told him, why the hell do you want to build uh, uh, your warehouse. Right now you can buy ships for nothing. Uh, uh, you can anchor them in the Paraná. You will have the humidity that the tobacco needs and you can store them uh, <laughs> and maybe <laughs> something will happen. And about two years later the market recovered and Onassis built a warehouse and took the ships and made ship and uh, <laughs> became a ship owner and you know what happened. So uh, I, I, we've seen this before uh, we will see the exact thing happening again simply because the, the business is self-correcting, okay? Okay, and that's a great lesson for us from, from history on which to end the conference. I'd like to thank all of our speakers and, um, and panelists. <laughs> I'd also like to thank the the organizers um, slide to open. I'd like to thank all of our sponsors, including um, Basil Karatsas and his advisory firm. But most of all, ladies and gentlemen, I'd li like to thank you. You've been the real stars of the show. You've come up with some great questions today. And um, thank you for your patience in staying with us for this long day and for, for being very involved in this uh, uh, event and we hope to see you next year. Um, there are already plan plans afloat for, for repeating this event, and this event and thank you so much for your, your patience and your attendance. And thank you, Yuri.